the spiritual context in which it arose. I like to think of the Final Works exhibition as a conversation, um, a conversation between myself and Arthur as I learned about him and his work and his visions. So, in my own work, I've been involved in projects that focus on creating traditional gardens. I'll talk a little bit about my work and then I'll move into art. So I just want to show you a little bit about the different kinds of curating that I've been involved in. Um, I just got back from northern New Mexico and uh, northern Arizona, and I was uh, down there. I was, I'm on a, I have a um, Chalmers residency this year, and so um, it involves creating gardens. But I went down there and did a little bit of research. And what I'm really interested in is um, uh, traditional food and, how, and, and the impact of traditional food on, on our diets. Um, one of the reasons for that is in my community there's, there's been an epidemic of, of diabetes since I can remember uh, and many others. So I've done a little bit of research with some native artists as well as farmers and gardeners who grow traditional food and they use that to feed their communities. And, and there, there's a couple of writers who claim that that's the answer, you know, this traditional diet. So I went down there to, um, to speak with them. And uh, also, because I'm a curator, I was really interested in how you know, the gardens and food production is really connected to the, to the, um, to the um, art down there. Um, there are Chena dolls, so you have the dances, you also have the visual culture. It's really connected. In fact, there's one guy down there who says, you know, you can't really have art in the garden. Art for me, but <laughs> you wouldn't have gardens without art. It's like, most obvious things because you need, but but the other but down there, you know, there's such a connection with with, with water because it's so dry that they rely on the dances and they rely on the carved figures to help them, you know, um, to bring in the water and control the water. So I found, so I, I did bring back some some beans and a few other things to grow in my gardens. And so I'm working on that. And part of the other project is. Um, is um, <clears throat> well, I'll get to that in just a second here. Okay, uh, okay. We call the projects that I've been working on. We call it the Gitigan project, and Gitigan is a word for garden in Anishinaabe and Maa, and we like that word. It really gives us, it provides us a, not only a method for how we do our gardens, but it um, it um, it allows us. To, create a space for growing native food, medicine gardens, but and the work allows us to create a better diet, to connect to the land and cycles, it strengthens community and promotes a sustainable lifestyle. And so the Get Again project shares its research and findings through performances, visual art projects, and working in the community and creating food-centered events. Uh, we work with many community members, preserves, elders, traditional medicines, stories, language, so we include all that into our projects. Um, we've had great, we've had great fun doing performances. We've had great fun creating visual, um, visual art projects. So a lot of it has to do with, with you know, um, just sharing that information, you know, what we learned from the gardens. Because it's really important. A generation ago, um, from the reserve ground, from everyone had gardens. Everyone grew their own food. This generation, no vegetables. <laughs> but the gardens are still there. So my brother and I and some others from the get to the project, we kind of taken them over. So when I began to think about the Arthur Schilling project, it was very different for me. Um, it seemed that it felt very traditional to me. Um, there was oil paint on, on canvas, most of them are um, forfeiture, and you know, showing those in the gallery. I kind of had to shift there a little bit. Um, also, I was working with an artist who wasn't alive any longer. Um, Arthur had been passed on for almost 30 years when I started this project. Um, so I had to come up with a different way to engage in, in a conversation and learn about his work. I couldn't talk to him. So I began conversations with family members, Millie, Travis, and Dewap. And Millie is Arthur's wife, and Travis and Dewap are his sons. 
earlier. And um, also with um, um, Parker's younger brother, my uncle Paul, as well as his sister, um, Lena, Lena Matouche, both artists. So we had great conversations about, you know, growing. I got to know him much better, you know, um, um, you know as, a, as a person as well as a painter and his struggles and what he was trying to do. I read interviews, I talked to his friends, collectors, and I looked really closely at his work. I remember there was a time, I think I muttered underneath my breath when I was looking at all the works in the studio, and Travis was there. Um, I said, oh, I just wish he was here. I'd love to talk to him about it. And Travis looks at me and goes, well, if you really look at his work, everything is really there for you. Everything is there, you know? He's let you know everything. So that was really, um, that was really strong for me. So when the works did come into the gallery, and I was standing there one day, I remembered those words um, as, I, as I looked at everything. You know, looked at the, his, he painted in different, he, he painted a lot of different kinds of paintings, but each one of them tells you something. And we, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But, um, another thing was, uh, I did have a bit of reluctance to do this show. Um, I knew it was really important, and I was busy with other projects. And I knew that this would take a lot of my time. It wasn't something I was going to do a little bit on the side here. And, and he was my partner of Schilling with my uncle. You know, he was growing up, he was always this, this really important figure. He was, you know, he was someone unusual, he was different. You know, um, I go to his place as a little kid. And, and he would always know what to do. People would come to him, like he was always building, so he'd be drawing over here, but people would come, how do you do this? Oh, you just you know, cut that over there, and you have that. And he, you know, he ended up with this huge, he was always building a huge timber frame um, studio. So there was that. I was a bit I was a little bit nervous, but um, a couple of things happened that kind of shifted me a little bit. And one of them was, um, I'd run into Millie, this is his wife, um, I ran into her at Rama, I was visiting some friends, family, and she was there. And we had a conversation, um, we chatted, she asked what I was doing, I told her about my projects. And then, well, maybe a week or so later, I get a call in my, my office. And this is at Trent University, you know, in the middle of the afternoon, so I'm like, oh, I answer, it's Millie. She's very mild, but she's going, uh, I don't know why you're doing these projects that you're doing. You don't need to do those. What you need to do is you need to do the Arthur Schilling show. You need to, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And she's telling, she's telling me this for like half an hour. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, you know, I'll, I'll think about it. No, 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 you don't think about it. This is what you need to do. This is your path. No one else is going to do it. So, you know, um, afterwards I, I hung up the phone and I thought about it. Again, you know, I was busy with my other work. I was working on a PhD at the time while doing other projects. I just kind of planted a seed in me. So uh, shortly afterwards, um, I was at the art gallery at Peterborough. Celeste, Scott Valetti's the director, was there. And we're all out at dinner, because that must have been after the show. And we're all at a, at a restaurant. And I said, well, the strangest thing happened. You know, Millie called me. He says, I should do this show, Arthur Show. I said, oh, I think they have a couple of pieces from the um, Arthur's book. This is Arthur's book. Or something. Mm -hmm. Saints? Um, the Dream. I said, I think there's a couple of those paintings in the studio still. I didn't really know, you know but I heard that there was. <clears throat> so Celeste, so very smart. She's, she thinks about it, you know, encourages me to, to write a brand for a small research. Uh, small research grant. So why don't you do it? She, she can tell my reluctance. But she says, well, just write the grant, see what happens, you know? Just do a little research, it'll be no big deal. And so I did the research, a lot, you know, so I contacted um, um, different dealers, galleries, I talked to the family, I read all his interviews, and at the end of the, um, at the end of that research project, I realized really how important this project was. And I, it gave me a, a way to position it um, in, 
one of the important things was the 10 years, looking at just the final 10 years. I didn't want to do a whole retrospective, but it, it was too much. But the focus on these 10 years felt really comfortable for me. Um, but, but being a family member also brought up something else. Um, uh, there's, a, you know, I felt like I was, I was an insider. I was able to get in, you know, work with the family, but also I felt an outsider as well. You know, I was working outside the community. I didn't move around. I worked, as, I worked outside the community, and I felt like I was coming back in. Uh, when I lived in Rama, um, Travis and Dewa, I didn't live in Rama. They lived in Toronto. And when I moved out of Rama, they moved back in Rama. So, you know, there was a few years between seeing them. Although I contacted them, we had even a great email conversations about, about this project. Um, most of them, they didn't, they didn't respond back to me, but when they did, they were possible. They said, yes, it's great. And so, um, so as an example of the, um, of the, uh, the tension I felt, um, really came together <clears throat> when I first met with the family as a meeting about the show. And I, I had done a lot of research already. Um, we had set up appointments, but they were canceled. Uh, they couldn't make it. It went, it went on for a little while, a couple of months at least. But I remember feeling very, very um, tense. I was going, oh, I got the show. starting, you know, we have a lot of games coming down. Um, people are interested in the show we had. Um, I researched a lot of games. I was interested in a lot. But I knew that the real crux of this, um, this exhibition was going to be the ones from the book. I, I really those. Oh, but I didn't really know how many they had. So I went there. I would finally set up another, a meeting. We met over at Wabin's place in, in, um, in a real this evening. I showed up there very professional. You know, here I am, the curator. Uh, I wanted to be able to show that I'm professional and I'm really serious about them. They're just a family member wanting to do this little show or something. So I show up there and I'm dressed nice and now I got all my catalogs ready, they're all professional. We're sitting at the table and they're going, yeah, this looks great, this looks great. And I says, okay, I got the courage. I said, so how many paintings do you have? You know, from the book, how many paintings? And they looked at me and they said, we have them all. <laughs> and I said, we have them all. Because I know that in those 30 years span that they have been approached by uh, collectors wanting to buy them. And so um, I found this up in my research, and um, I said, this is amazing. How many can I borrow? I said, you can borrow them all. <laughs> and I said, um, this is just like a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why didn't you sell them? You know? And Millie says to me, she goes, we couldn't possibly sell them. She said, they're Arthur's life. They're his philosophy. And they're his gift to Canada. And she said that she was saving them because she wanted them to be in a show that would travel across Canada. And one of the stipulations that she had in her own mind about who would do this work, she wanted it to be a family member. So, so when I came there, she said, this is what we're waiting for. So I knew it felt tense. But, you know, it was, it was a quite relief. It was quite relief. And then the show took on. A different feel after that, so we had the words. Um, so after this happened, um, we had to focus. We had to focus. There were so many interesting stories that came from from this research. There was, and so there were wonderful stories that I wanted to include. And, and as a curator, when you get into a project that's really rich. You kind of get in the middle of it, and there's, there's there's so many different layers and ideas and things going on um, that it's easy to um, think about. The, you you kind of lose your focus. Um, and well, like for this show, I envisioned at the beginning, you know, he has he has great clothes. Um, he's got wonderful drawing books. Um, there's other stories about uh, his life from family members and collectors. I wanted like this quote all on the wall. I wanted to 
film over there being shown. It's such a rich life. I wanted to, to show that. Um, there was wonderful stories I wanted to be part of the exhibit. Like, um, there was this one about the um, about this this collector in Ottawa. He's got a factory. He um, he does um, he builds um, pharmaceutical equipment, big factory, all this heavy duty equipment. And I met with him there. I know he I knew he collected Arthur's works. So I set up a meeting with him. I met him at his factory on a Sunday. Nobody was there but him and myself. And um, in this factory, he's got giant paintings in the factory floor of large European paintings, oil, giant paintings all through the factory. And we're walking along and going, this is quite amazing. I don't think I've ever seen paintings in the factory before. But it's a very clean factory because it's pharmaceutical equipment. He says, yeah, I can sell those paintings. And um, so we're walking along. We come to a white room. We go into this white room. It's a gallery in this factory. Just, just a professional gallery, the lighting, the walls, the movable walls. And in it, he's got 10 Arthur Schilling paintings in there. And um, so I found that to be pretty amazing. Another really interesting story, a really important story in, in this exhibition, is um, it's the story of Rudy and Gloria Bees. Um, if we go back to um, the fall of 1975, Arthur Schilling was quite ill. He was 34 years old. He was in Soldiers Memorial Hospital. He was expected, he was expected to die. He was, um, um, he had a really bad heart. It was from childhood illness, um, rheumatic fever, and it damaged his heart valve. And so at the age of 34, he was in the hospital. And back then it was really risky. Surgery, and um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's really glorious, yeah, sure. right? <laughs> but they wanted Arthur to um, to paint some portraits of their of their children, and so they went up to Rama looking for Arthur Schiller. They had not seen his work in Toronto for a while, so they went up looking for him and found the studio where he worked and lived, and. Um, uh, they walked into the house, and there were seven paintings there. And you wanted one. It was, it was his mother's house. Yeah, okay, it was his mother's house. Okay, so it was across the street there. So um, the family was there, but Arthur wasn't. And that, they had never met before yet. So, so Ruby and Gloria just came into his life at that time when he was in the hospital. And um, so he wasn't there. And um, I guess you were about to leave, and then Paul, Arthur's younger brother, sits to you. He's in the hospital. If you go there, it's okay to visit. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, so they went. You guys went up on the its way out of town, really. And we see Arthur, and he didn't want to talk about art. But I think you asked him about that um, painting. And he said, no, he says, that's all I have for Billy. He has seven mm -hmm. paintings. He um, dying. Two, two, three, two minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so you left, you went back to Toronto, and Gloria, you had a relative who was at St. Mike's, it was really at St. Mike's, at St. Mike's, which is a hospital in Toronto. And so you got you contacted him and asked and told him about Arthur. And he said that, well, you have to call the family. If they say it's okay, bring him down. So you when you were calling all the different shows. <laughs> he spoke to J.K. Wilson, who's the top internist in Canada, over the top of the right. He was J.K. Wilson. It's one of the family to request right. to, 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 to be involved. So he said, yes. Uh, the family said, yes. I guess it took a little while. Well, there were weeks we were in his building. We were strangers. Yeah, that's right. So he was he was taken by ambulance to um, St. Michael's. They performed the risky surgery. In fact, he died on the table there. They revived him, came back, um, and he lived almost ten years. Exactly ten years. So, so that's what this is about. These are the final ten years. His paintings changed after that. So, so those are the kind of stories I wanted. 
to include um, an auto history of quotes. We had to get one where um, he was asked by a reporter how he wanted to be remembered. And he goes, he goes, I want to be remembered as a great man who saw beauty. A man who was fortunate at a glimpse of the great spirit's aura. I followed his broken path with fire, his broken path with fireflies in my head. So he had all these great quotes. I wanted to ask her about the law. <laughs> and also he was such a great drawer, he had drawings he had to do his um, Travis Delphine, he's got um, just many, many, many of these drawing books. He was always drawing. So I wanted to put there. But, but what happened was um, um, we had a meeting at the gallery in Celeste. And her great wisdom again says to us, ask the most obvious question. She says, why are we doing the show? Well, why are we doing it? Is it because of all these stories about Arthur? Um, or what was it? And she says, um, okay, let's identify five key pieces in the show that you can't live without. And she goes, let's talk about why they are important. And so what emerged from this is that, you know, it was also talking with other artists, because a lot of artists have seen these works as we're bringing them in. Um, <clears throat> all the artists from museum crews who did the framing as well as the desk, they're all trained in. But one thing that came up everybody was that was an extraordinary skill that he had as an artist and what he was using his art to talk about. So um, so that changed everything. That really focused. Because all of a sudden, you know, it was like, you know, everything needs to be clear. We need to clean, we need to not have any distractions. I want, you know, the um, the viewer to come into the gallery and just it's just them and the painting. I wanted to see what Arthur was trying to say. I didn't want to have any distractions. Um, and you can see this in the didactic that we did. It's very clear. It's very clear in um, what we were trying to do. Um, and you can also see like this also helped um, set up the space for us is the quote at the very beginning of the didactic. And this is a quote from Arthur Schilling from his book here. He says, the dream transforms life. For a bright illuminated instant, the shackles of everyday eyes are shattered, and the gracefulness of life is laid bare. All things begin here, my new beauty of Jibway dream. So for me, what he's saying is like, like all the everyday stuff would leave, and just have that purity of looking, you know, that and he's going to tell us about that. This is what his work is about. So I, I felt that to come into the space was really part of his dream. It was, it was, you know, him um, trying to speak to you about that, that real specific space, that dream that he had. It also changed my essay too. Um, I had many drafts. I was going through editing and everything. Once I saw all the words, it was like, stop, I need to refresh this. So I, I just pieces of it, but it didn't really, it really mm -hmm. affect me. So, to speak from your heart is to reveal your truth. Truth in a Anishinaabe moment is Odeb Wayman. The word that means work hard, Odeb, within it. Is not an objective truth, but instead is to tell what one knows according to his or her perception and according to one's fluency. Arthur Schilling's paintings in the final works of the exhibition reveal this truth that he saw in that hospital room over 40 years ago. From that dream, he wanted all of us to see the depth of this caring for the Ojibwe people. He saw us as strong, complex, spiritual, beautiful people and wanted to share this through his paintings. His portraits and self-portraits are, are affirming. They are counter narratives with the usual negative depictions that we see so often. Arthur Schilling gave us a starting point for reimagining ourselves, but left the future for all of us to create together. In the final panel of the, the mural behind me, The Beauty of Our People, he left the final panel deliberately unfinished. It is in this space that we can insert our own dreams and begin to transform our lives into other possibilities of existence. 
just like in that old Earth Diver story. He brought up a small morsel of clay from the depths, and with his breath created the world from that vision. He had to transform it to fulfill his vision, and it began at that place of dreaming. I feel that heart of showing we want all of us to do here today. That this is what he envisioned when he was painting his studio in Grand. He would have wanted all of us to gather with this work around us, to look at it, talk about it, enjoy it, and to feel within ourselves the kind of world he felt we could all have. One that is filled with beauty and color, an art that helps us to think about how we're all connected with each other and with the larger world. In the Ojibwe dream, he wrote that, he said, my thoughts are like smoke signals, big billows of cloud rising into the sky. My pillow is a burning log. You can break holes over my body, but that will not put this fire out. And as I look around this room, I see the paintings here. I see everyone here. And I can see that Arthur Schilling's fire is still burning. Thank you.